I'm Reverend Rick, and it is my honor to be with you today. We really hope that this video is a blessing to you. And if it is, please consider making a donation. People watch our videos locally when they cannot necessarily come to church throughout the United States and the world. So please join us and click the link below and make a donation. Thank you and let this be a blessing to you. All right, now you're gonna have to double task here. So if you put your hand over your eyes, and repeat after me, I open my eyes to see the spiritual truth today. Ears to hear the spiritual truth today. I open my ears to hear the spiritual truth today. And open your arms and extend out your arms. I open my heart to receive the spiritual truth today. I open my heart to receive the spiritual truth today. The spiritual truth that I'm working with today is that action in unity with your purpose will move you boldly into the direction of your dreams. Action not contemplation, not awareness, action in unity with your purpose will move you directly in the direction of your dreams. You know, uh, the Lord Krishna said, uh, said this in the Bhagavad Gita, actions that consciously support our dharma have the power to gather energy. These outward actions, step by step, shape us inwardly. Find your dharma and then do it. And in the process of doing it, energy begins to gather itself into a laser beam of effectiveness. Yeah, I see some of you have your phones out, others are taking notes. If you would just contemplate this all week for, for seven days until we meet again, your life would jump. Your life would jump in there. You know, uh, we're doing a little series right now on the Bhagavad Gita. It's going to be a three-week series. We did one last week. We're doing one today, and we're doing one uh, next week. And the truth be told, I could spend an entire year talking about the lessons of the Bhagavad Gita. But for this series, I'm only uh, uh, focusing on the four pillars to help us be in action around our dharma, to be taking action. And as we said last year, you know, last week, it's important for us to focus on the beingness of our lives, on just being divine beings without doing anything, but it's equally important for us to be aware of the power of action in our lives. Because even those of us who are meditators, even those of us who are contemplators, the majority of our life is spent in action. So when we get that action that is in unity with our purpose, with our calling in life, things begin to change for us. Uh, in Science of Mind, we'd say it this way. We'd say, treat and move your feet. And what that means is, be aware of who you are, pray, and keep moving. Don't stop. Keep moving in your life. Well, the first pillar of these four that we're talking about during this series, um, in the first pillar, uh, Lord Krishna says to Prince Arjuna, now let me just go back. The series is this. It's based on uh, a 700 verse poem called the Bhagavad Gita, which is a sacred script of the Hindus, and it is in the middle of another sacred script. But, but you know, if you lived in India, chances are you would have already memorized the 700 verse poem. You would already know about it. You'd be very familiar with the Bhagavad Gita because it is a teaching tool for success and for happiness in our lives. So while I'm only so focusing on these four, uh, the first pillar, the first pillar, uh, in the first pillar, uh, Lakshmi says to Lord, uh, to uh, Prince Arjuna, now, let me go back again. It, it actually, the Bhagavad Gita takes place on a battlefield. It's a conversation that takes place on a battlefield. Prince Arjuna is the head army guy of this battle, okay? And he's frozen in doubt. He's paralyzed by confusion. 
he's paralyzed by worry. In fact, he's so paralyzed, he's down on the bottom of his chariot trying to pick himself up. You ever been there where you're just, you're down. You're down, maybe for a minute, maybe for a week, maybe for a longer period. But you're just out. Well, Lord Krishna, who is his chariot driver, who's also God, says to him many things that bring him out of this terrible paralyzing funk into being an active prince and army guy again. One of the things that he says is um, uh, you can't be who you want to be. Look at, remember, he pounds us into him verse after verse. You cannot be who you want to be. You cannot be who you want to be. You have to be who you are. Now it doesn't mean and I want to say this in a metaphysical church because we always tell people, and I've said it, and I've believed it, I've said it to myself, you can be anything you want to be. No, you can't. You can do anything you want to do. There are no limitations on what you can do, but you have to be who you are. You can't be who somebody else is. So he tells them that. That's a kind of the basis of what he's saying. He's talking about his dharma. You have to find your dharma. Now, as I said last week, there are many definitions of the word dharma. One of the definitions is teaching. It's probably the most common definition of the word dharma. But in Hindu culture, and within the, the framework of the Bhagavad Gita, we're going to use uh, their definition which, of dharma, which is your essence. It's your code. It's who you are. Everybody here is imprinted with a code when you get here. And you know, parents, mothers, you know this. You know that you have two or three kids and they're different. How is that? They're in the same home, they're nurtured by the same people, but they're totally different because of their code, because of the imprint that they came with. And we can be even greater moms and dads if we begin to look at that imprint and celebrate what that, not what we want, but what that imprint is for them. Krishna tells Arjuna, don't worry about the outcome. Success and failure are not your concern. Better to fail at your dharma than to succeed in somebody else's dharma. And haven't we all tried that? I've tried that. You try and be somebody you're not, to please somebody else or to do something. That's not who you are. Better to fail at your dharma than to succeed in somebody else's dharma. Our task in life is to gather as much force as we can gather to execute our own dharma. Krishna goes on to tell Arjuna, don't waste time calculating your chances for success or failure. Don't waste time. Just fix your aim and begin. Just fix your aim and begin. And that's in support of today's spiritual principle. Action, coupled with in unity with your purpose, will move you boldly in the direction of your dream. So let's keep going uh, on the four pillars. Remember la four pillars. Last one is know your dharma. Understand your embedded code. You don't know how to do that. Get the tape. But you also can just look at your own idiosyncrasies. What makes you unique? What makes you you? What, when you were a child, really caught your fancy? That has a lot to do with your dharma in this life. You're not sure what your dharma is? Krishna tells Arjuna this. Look, it is close to you. In fact, your dharma, the knowledge, your awareness of your dharma is within spitting distance of where you are right now. Because, see, our natural flow in life will keep bringing us closer to our dharma. We may push it back. We may say we're not good enough. My mother doesn't want me to do this. Whatever. There's a, there's a, we have a famous artist in the congregation, a 9 o'clock guy, and his mother uh, took away his paint sets when he was 8 years old because she could see the writing on the wall. She could see his dharma, and she was worried for him because painters, in her mind, didn't make a lot of money. See, we know what our, we're spitting is it's we're close to our dharma. We may have to go back to it, but it's right near us. But 
you know, knowledge of knowing your Dharma is only step one, and there are four action steps to these pillars. There are four pillars. And the second uh, pillar is do it full out. Once you find your Dharma, do it full out. Don't mince around, don't whisper. No. No. Do it full out. See, be committed to your relationship with that code that is inside of you. Give it time, give it focus. Make early decisions to create environments that allow you to be you and do it full out. And see, here's the thing. It's gonna require you to say no to some other activities in your life that are very attractive, that you think maybe I'd like to do that. But if you're fully committed to your dharma, you make sure that you're creating an environment that supports that dharma. And a dispersed, dispersed environment uh, is not that. See, doing it full out may require you to snip off some other options. You have to decide on what it is you want to focus on. You know, the word decide that comes from the root word to clip off. You need to decide, you need to clip off some things that are not in support of your dharma. Robert Frost, who is one of the great American poets, he won four uh, Pulitzer Prizes uh, for his poetry uh, in his life. He, uh, he learned uh, that he had to decide about his dharma and to li uh, live it against living an easier life. And you know, that's so true for all of us, I think. We have this dharma, we have this code, we have this purpose in our life, but it's not easy. And because it's not easy, we don't fully commit to it. We don't full out with it. We kind of do some of it, but not all of it in our life. What made him great was not only his gift, but his commitment to his gift. In retrospect, Frost says he knew what his dharma was, he didn't use that word, but he knew what his purpose was when he was uh, a teenager. He loved to work outdoors with his hands when he was a teenager. And in retrospect, he said he loved to do things like uh, go and be with other guys. You know, he was, a, he was a young guy. He loved to be with other guys and load wagons and stack firewood and just work with his hands. And he realized later, he wrote, it wasn't actually the working with the hands, although I liked that because it brought me out into nature. And you know, nature is the muse for poets. And so he, he, he liked that, but what he really liked was learning the cadence and the rhythm of how the men spoke. He loved learning the language of how they spoke. And so he, uh, as a result of that, uh, he worked outside during the day, and then at night he would come in and his mother would read poetry. She read him Wordsworth and um, Longfellow and Bryant and other great poets, and so she would read him that every night and when he was about 20, he realized what his code was. It was to be a poet. That was his tone. That was his essence in his life. So we say thank you, Mother Frost, for doing all that work. You should be celebrated here on this day of Mother's Day. His first poem was called My Butterfly. And it, it got kind of some traction in the newspaper. And one of the people who read this poem was uh, a rich guy, and he said, God, this guy's gonna be a genius. His poetry is fabulous. I'm gonna get him a literary advisor. And so he paid for a literary advisor. And the literary advisor said to him, this is good, but you need to elevate your speech because you're speaking like a common man. And it incensed him. It incensed Robert Frost because his gift was to bring the voice of everyday language to poetry. It was actually a gift in disguise because it made him so mad he found his dharma. Yeah. And that happens sometimes to us. People say, oh, you can't do that. Oh, yeah, you got me. I'll be doing it in a hot second. So he continued to uh, go on, but at some point he realized 
that he had to eat, and poetry wasn't going to let him eat at this point in his life. He had to have a roof over his head. So he began to make decisions. He began to create an environment which would allow him to do his dharma and also eat and have a roof over his head. So he realized that he liked nature, and so he bought a farm. And so he, far, he did chicken farming in the morning, because you know chicken farming is an early activity day. And then in the a afternoon and evening, he would sit at the kitchen table and he would write poetry. Well, a local college got wind that he was in the area, and so they hired him to teach. So now he's doing farming in the morning, teaching in the afternoon, and writing poetry uh, at the night in his life. And he realized at some point, look, I've got to start clipping. I've got to make a decision. How am I going to do this dharma? So he, he sold, he said, I'm a teacher, I'm a farmer, and I'm a poet. Which do I want to be? Where is my genius? Where is my code sending me? And he realized it was poetry. So he and his wife sold the farm and moved to England. And he wrote, just wrote poetry from that time on. See? How many of us in this room are willing to snip, to clip off for a commitment to our dharma? Are we willing to move to another location? Are we willing to have a crap job during the day so we can do our dharma at night? Are we willing to upset our family members who want us to do this and that when it isn't our dharma and we know it's not our dharma? Because in order for us to be truly happy, we have to be connected. We have to be in action to with our dharma. Lakshmi tells Prince Ajuna, don't vacillate. Do not <coughs> vacillate. Actions taken in support of our dharma will change self. Actions taken in support of your dharma will change the self. Actions taken in support of our dharma will change us. See, we spend so much time trying to figure out how to change ourselves, and if we were just committed to our dharma and doing a few little things toward it, it will change us in our life. See, commitment to uh, those things bring us dharma power. Bring us dharma power and then things be ha begin to happen. And Ernest Holmes would say it this way, uh, intention coupled with commitment has bold magic in it. Intention coupled with commitment has bold magic in it. So the second pillar is do it full out. Your coach should not be kept silent. You know, people should see you coming. They should see your dharma before they even see you in your life. We don't want to keep it, keep it uh, hidden. And it's not always easy because you know what? There are a lot of people in the world who would make getting our dharma difficult, getting, make it challenging for us. For whatever reason, their own fears, their own limitations, but they can make it difficult for us. Perhaps no greater character on the planet in history has been more ill-served by stereotyping, by lame biographies, than Susan B. Anthony. And while she had no physical children, she truthfully is the mother of all of us men and women in this room because she brought a freedom, a freedom to all those of us here and should be celebrated on Mother's Day. She championed women's rights and she was depicted as some wizened, tired, tight-lipped, old do-gooder, probably hated men, probably hated sex, probably hated all the pleasures in life. That's what they kept saying in all the newspaper articles about Susan B. Anthony. But the reality is she wasn't like that at all. She was very charming. She was very eloquent. She was very commanding in this life. She faced down the halls of frightened men who were worried about their property values, meaning their women, 
and they weren't kind to her when she went to speak. And yet, she was committed to her dharma. She was committed to what she was doing in this life. She almost single-handedly created the strategy that started the enfranchisement of women. She lived, she loved passionately. She worked single-mindedly. She played full out against a lot of odds in this life. She was born a Quaker. She was born of parents who respected her, but more importantly than respecting her, they educated her. And that didn't happen during that time. Remember, this was a time in which women were literally, not metaphorically, literally property of men. They couldn't enter into contract. They couldn't have any money of their own. They were literally property of men before Susan B. Anthony got on the scene and began to understand her dharma. You know, in those days, you could be one of two things. You could be married or you could be a spinster. And if you were married, you were the property. If you weren't married, you weren't the property, but you were probably very poor. You were probably living in poverty during that time. Now, remember the words of Krishna to Arjuna. You cannot be anything you want to be. You can do anything you want to do, but you cannot be anything you want to be. You have to be who you are. Susan B. Anthony opted out of being property to anybody else. She opted into finding her voice. That's her dharma. And she committed fully to finding her voice for the voiceless. She had to clip away some things. You know, there are people in this church right now who have that same dharma, who are finding their voice for the voiceless. And I'm telling you, if that's your dharma, and you're working hard at having a voice for the voiceless, I love you, I respect you, I honor you, and I know how difficult that could be in a day, in an hour, and even in a minute. You have to look to Susan B. Anthony and say, if she can do it, I can do it too. I can begin to find my voice for the voiceless in this life. She uh, was not a natural public speaker. And so she had to clip away what many of us have to clip away, no matter what our dharma is, and that is fear of failure. You know, a lot of us have a dharma. We know what the dharma is, but we can't go full out because of the fear of failure. That ha You have to make a decision. You have to clip away that kind of fear. You have to work at it. You have to pray about it. You have to meet with practitioners about it. You have to do what, you have to read books about it. You have to do whatever you need to do to clip away that fear as she did in her life. Like I say, she was not a natural public speaker. It scared the Jesus out of her to get up and do a talk, especially a talk in front of people who were so hostile to her. But she did it because she was committed to her dharma. She was committed to it. She was vilified in the press. She was ridiculed. She was spit upon. She had the same walk that Jesus had at his crucifixion, only she had it day after day after day after day, week after week, year after year. They never let up. And yet 10,000 people came to view her body at her death. She didn't start out to be famous. She started out to be committed to her dharma, which is the voice for the voiceless. We all have a dharma in our life. Once unified with your dharma, once you're with your code, Krishna says that um, the change in your life will simply take effect. You don't have to work at it. It'll simply happen as a result of that. The act of committing, the act of committing. You all have gifts, but unless you're committed to the gifts, you're not going to be able to reach the full dharmic potential that you have on the planet. So next week we'll take the last two. First one, know your dharma. Second one, play full out. 
see what you can do this week to actually play full out with your dharma. Even those of us who are playing full, we think we're playing full out with our dharma. See if you can't play even more full out with your dharma. See where that takes you. Let's take this message into prayer. There's only one power. It's the power of love, and it runs right through me. And so I'm simply open to the divine. I don't have to work at it. I just have to be open to it. And for me, that takes work. Being open. Saying, let love in and let love out. I give thanks for that. I release this word into the law together we say, and so it is.